Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Embassy of Italy for uh, uh, our first digital uh, diplomacy series of this year. Uh, 2017 will be a very important year for Italy and the international stage. Uh, in addition to seating on the UN Security Council, uh, this year we'll be, uh, we hold the presidency of the G7, which will peak, as you probably know, with the summit in Taormina, which will be the first summit for the Trump administration and for several other leaders, including the British Prime Minister Theresa May, our own Prime Minister Paolo Gentiloni, and the next president of France. To highlight the Italian presidency of the G7 and to give a better outreach to our audience here in the States, uh, we have launched a campaign on our social media uh, to describe what we do in the G8, what the, G8, uh, the G7 is. Uh, and I invite everybody to follow G7 in US on Twitter and our medium publication G7 in US and our medium profile in, on uh, Italy in US. As you may know, most of you are regular uh, followers of a series. Uh, this has started in 2012, touching upon the use of social media platforms uh, by the foreign policy community on internet freedom and rights, the role of women in tech and politics, the future of innovation and more. Today, we'll be focusing on the intersection between news and the internet. How foreign policy falls into mainstream and online media. What impact that do, do have, do uh, so-called so fake news phenomena have on the realm of foreign policy. I want to thank our moderator today, uh, Bernadette Meehan, uh, who was until Friday, we just learned, uh, a foreign service officer at the Department of State. In her 13-year career, she served in Colombia, Iraq, United Arab Emirates, and most recently, a special assistant to the Secretary of State and as National Security Council spokesperson. Grazie, Bernadette. But also, grazie to all our panelists that Bernadette will introduce uh, in more detail. And uh, welcome to the audience here in the auditorium and watching us live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. That's to everybody. Bernadette, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, what I would like to do is introduce the panelists. Uh, I, I will then start off the conversation by asking a, a few questions just to get things rolling. Um, but I think these are most fun when it's the audience that gets to engage with the panel and, and ask questions. Let us know. Um, I will try to keep the questions sort of succinct and brief. Uh, and I know my, my colleagues will do the same in their answers, and then we'll turn it over to all of you, and I think we will also take some questions from social media um, that, that our colleagues from the embassy uh, will be calling as we go. So to introduce our panelists, uh, we have Matt Higginson, who is the head of politics and government affairs at Medium. In this role, he leads Medium's efforts to engage political leaders, government agencies, and everyday people to move the political dialogue forward. Thank you. Prior to Medium, he worked at One, a campaign and advocacy organization founded by Bono, focused on eradicating extreme global poverty. He also worked for U.S. Senator Harry Reid here in D.C. and led a variety of local and statewide campaigns and elections in his hometown of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, next to Matt, we have Rosie Gray, who is a former BuzzFeed News political reporter and who now covers U.S. politics and global affairs for The Atlantic. Uh, Bradley Clapper, on the end, is the acting national security editor for the Associated Press. Until recently, he was the State Department correspondent for AP. His previous assignments include the U.S. Congress, the United Nations, and the World Trade Organization. He has reported from 69 countries worldwide. And because I had to look at what the social media profile said, I have also seen from Twitter, since we're talking about social media, that he is an onophile, an ergophile, and a europhile. So interesting additions to the profile. Uh, and last but not least, we have Jessica Schulberg, who is a foreign affairs reporter at the Huffington Post, focusing on US foreign policy in the Middle East. She has also written for The New Republic and The Washington Post, and Twitter informs me that she also likes dogs. <laughs> so with that, uh, we will get the conversation started. Um, as uh, Andreas was kind enough to, to mention, uh, my background is as, as a government official. So my point of view in sort of 
questioning my fellow panelists who are all journalists or involved in, in media organizations um, comes from the point of view of being a government spokesperson and sort of pushing out effective messages and responding to questions that the guys, these guys have on a daily basis. Um, so I can say with authority that I don't think anyone would ever say the US government is sort of at the cutting edge uh, of anything that has to do with technology. Uh, we have a very bureaucratic process, a lot of red tape. Um, but I also think it's fair to say that Barack Obama was probably the first digital president. Um, um, and throughout the course of his administration, we saw an uptick in the types of digital tools that were available and the ways that the government used them. Um, I remember quite, uh, quite fondly when Susan Rice, the former national security advisor, first took to Twitter, uh, she was very resistant and she said, I don't do, quote, diplomacy by haiku. Um, and we had to really do a strong sales job on her to explain that you have this opportunity to distill topics um, in a very concise way. You talk directly to the audience. There's a lack of sort of political dub double speak because you have such a limited amount of time to sort of convey yourself. Uh, and sure enough, she sort of evolved and, and became a, a regular user. Um, so from there, I would sort of like to start, and I'm going to direct this first question to, to Brad. Um, I want to explore the concept of how the use of social media has changed the power centers in media and government and, and outside with other actors um, and, and discuss how media companies stay relevant when technology essentially allows anyone, including citizen reporters or casual observers, uh, to participate in the debate directly to the audience. Well, uh, I don't think it's fair that you give old traditional <laughs> AP the question about media relevancy. But, um, we're, we're adapting like everyone else, so um, it's as good for me as anyone else. Um, I, social media has made everything a lot faster. I think we all take it for granted. Um, but, you know, it was only a few years ago that Twitter came online and that people started writing things as they were happening. Um, <coughs> now it's a uh, direct upload of video. You can see coups taking place live. You can see disturbances. You can see violence. You can see things happening exactly as they're happening on the ground, anywhere, uploaded by anybody, uh, filtered in ways you're not sure about. And that completely changes the landscape for media. Um, Traditionally, obviously, the government was one of the, was probably the primary source uh, for news gathering, uh, especially in a place like Washington, where the government is the biggest player in town. And, you know, media in this place lives off what the government's doing, whether it's Congress, the White House, or the various federal agencies. But that's changing um, because there is such an immediacy uh, in terms of the events that are happening elsewhere. Uh, and how they are interplaying with things happening at the governmental level. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, last year I was on a trip with Secretary of State John Kerry, and you know, a trip with a, a foreign, dig uh, a top U.S. dignitary is is often scripted. You you fly to another country. There's a bilateral meeting with another foreign minister or head of state. You get a readout from the meeting. You might have a press conference. You might have a, a photo spray where you're allowed in the room and you hear some of the exchanges. And then you do your typical source reporting and background interviews to figure out what's going on. As John Kerry was meeting Russian President Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin, we were sitting on top of the Ritz-Carlton in Moscow watching on our live feeds as the Nice attack happened in Paris. Nothing they were doing in that room mattered much at that moment. And we were ahead of where the top US foreign policy official was in terms of knowledge of the world at that moment. The next day, in a 10 or 11 hour negotiating session on Syria, where again, Secretary of State Kerry was locked in a room with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov um, we were watching on Twitter as people were marching on a bridge and there was a coup going on in Turkey. Again, what the, the highest level of U.S. foreign policy was engaged in was kind of behind the curve. I mean, it wasn't the immediate story of the day. And it just kind of illustrated two times in 24 hours how um, 
the world is getting a lot closer, news is getting a lot faster, and the old way of kind of reporting on it didn't seem always relevant. So following on that thread, I'd like to turn to Matt, who is sort of a little bit different than the others on the stage because you're not a journalist, first of all. You, you work for sort of a, a media organization, I guess, in sure. some ways. Um, but medium.com is an open platform, right? So it gives a voice to ordinary citizens or anyone who sort of wants to share their story. Yeah. Um, so the question for you on the flip side of the coin would be, would medium categorize itself as a media platform or organization? Do you see yourselves as competitors to traditional media, or do you see yourselves as dovetailing with a broader sort Sort of journalist experience? I think that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I don't know how we would necessarily categorize ourselves. I think the lines between tech companies and media companies are becoming increasingly blurred. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing in, in, as a whole. I, I think you see the, the democratization of information and of people's ability to interact with news, to create news, to interact and, 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 and write and publish and, and get their voices heard. And I think that it's frankly a double-edged sword um, in, a, in a lot of ways. I think we as a, as a company, we would, we would recognize that and, and, um, and fess up to that and say that in many ways, some of the, some of the, some of the trends that we see in, in this day and age in, in terms of you know, the, the disinformation, the spread of disinformation, the hyperpolarization of, uh, of content and of news online um, is, 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 is a result of, of these, these great democratization tools, right? That's the great irony is these, these tools that, have, that were brought to democratize the way people get information has really just created these silos of information and these bubbles that people live in. Um, so I, you know, we would we would categorize ourselves, I guess, as as a as a media and tech company. We think that there is absolute value, and it's a, it's a net positive that more people have the ability to share their perspectives on things. We believe that there are millions of people in the world that have incredibly important, valuable, and valuable perspectives on the most consequential issues that the world is facing, but they don't have access to the op-ed pages of legacy, you know, news organizations. If they were to create a blog, they'd be siloed off in the corner of the internet somewhere, relying upon Facebook and Twitter to kind of uh, direct engagement or, or traffic to those to those ideas or to their perspectives. Um, but with the ability for those millions of people to who have smart perspectives and good insights on consequential issues, you also have millions of people that do not, mm -hmm. and they have access to those same tools. Um, and oftentimes, they the way that they frame their perspectives or opinions is very sensationalized and vitriolic and that gathers the most attention. Mm -hmm. So you've got really kind of this conundrum that's been created, I believe, um, augmented by the fact that, you know, people are spending less time reading valuable, thoughtful, nuanced perspectives and news. It's less part of our culture. You know, no, gone are the days when you'd go to a movie in the cinema and they would run a newsreel where you'd get your information before watching your film, right? Most of our media consumption now is entertainment based. Um, and I think that does an incredible disservice to the education and you know intellectual capacity of people at large and, and communities at large. So for the journalists on the panel, when you see content that's coming out from Medium, for example, and, and the Obama administration uses Medium quite frequently when President Obama announced his trip to Cuba, we used Twitter to announce it, and Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor, posted a very lengthy uh, article on Medium to explain the rationale behind the policy, the timing, so on and so forth. When a journalist sees that, is that a source? Do you pull from it? Um, and sort of going beyond that, not just talking about medium, as we see ordinary citizens sort of take to social media and digital media, um, and, and in this case I'm thinking about witting, witting people, like in the case of the turkey coup, live tweeting the coup, um, using Facebook and other mediums to uh, organize around the green revolution in Iran, uh, in Tahrir Square before we saw the fall of Hosni Mubarak. I mean, social media played such a, a critical role in that. Um, to also the unwitting people, and, and I'm always reminded of the, the Pakistani man in Abbottabad, uh, who mm. unwittingly and unknowingly live tweeted the Osama bin Laden raid. Right, and nobody knew it at the time, but he was essentially providing a TikTok of, of what happened before anyone really knew. Um, so the question is, how do you all evaluate those sources and use those and incorporate them? How do you fact check? How do you decide whether you need to go out on your own and verify information or just pull from what citizens are providing? Well, you know, anything could be a source of information. Um, and it's our job as journalists to be able to vet uh, stuff that's being put out there. And I think that's kind of the difference between you know, all of this 
this massive influx of information that is able to be disseminated by just regular citizens. And what we're able to do as journalists, which is vet that information and, you know, be able to tell readers this is what's true and this what this is, you know, what isn't. Um, but I mean, I, I would never just like pull some random tweet and then use it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you have to like be able to figure out what's and, and the way that you do that is just through reporting. I mean, and is that reporters way. on the ground? I mean, if this is someone in Turkey or in Egypt or in Iran, how are you how are you actually sort of pulling information that may give you a lead and, and doing what you do, which is sort of distilling it and giving it the context and building it into a story for your readers? It depends on what the story is and what the reporting is going to look like. But I mean, like, obviously, you would want to talk to the person, you know, figure out the context of, of what what they're saying, what they're doing. I mean, look, I've been a political reporter for I, I don't even remember my life before the 2016 election. So, I, but um, but you know, Jessica might be able to talk a little bit more about dealing with sources overseas. Um, I think Iran's a really good example because that's a country where you don't have that many, at least American reporters, on the ground right now. And so that is a place where relying on Twitter to find sources and figure out what's going on could be very useful. Um, but as Rosie says, it would be completely irresponsible um, and probably cut your career short if you were just to publish something based on something you saw in a tweet. But it is a good way to say, you know, you can reach out to people who are tweeting things that are happening, and it's a good way to develop connections to people on the ground. Uh, you sort of figure out if multiple people on Twitter are saying the same things and they don't seem to know each other. Uh, that could be a source of cooperation. You, you interview them, you figure out where they're getting their knowledge from. Um, another thing that was sort of interesting with Iran is during the nuclear negotiations, um, and even the lead up to the prisoner exchange last January, I think there was kind of a level of cooperation between American and Iranian journalists where, uh, you know, I don't, I don't speak Farsi, I can't tell what Zarif is saying every day, and a lot of the stuff he says in Iran doesn't get translated to English or really make its way to America. Uh, the Iranian reporters are a bit more savvy. They were watching our daily press briefings every day. Um, I know this because when the live stream would cut out, I would get reporters in Iran frantically emailing me saying, what did Kirby say? Can you forward me the transcript? Um, they were really fascinated and there was this kind of interesting de facto cooperation. Um, and I was actually in Geneva with Brad uh, when the prisoner exchange went down and it was sort of interesting to see this convergence of Iranian and American journalists um, and who would get what first because we each had our, our opposite sources. Great. I think uh, yeah. one thing is you, you touched on something really interesting, which is how you deal with kind of places that are not really well discovered mm -hmm. or well covered, I should say, by the West and Western journalists. And I know we're investing in technology and I'm sure all our competitors are. And there's fascinating kind of new things that are being developed, like kind of systems that are created that can try to sift through the noise of mm -hmm. social media mm -hmm. and you can let's say you, you think there's, there's, there's a disturbance in Tahrir Square. So you can kind of take various social media networks and zero in on every tweet within 10 blocks of Tahrir Square and cross-reference the word bomb. And then if you start, you know, seeing a level graph and then a spike, you know, at some point, you get an indication that there might have been a bomb or a bomb threat Mm -hmm. in or around Tahrir Square. Mm -hmm. These are just kind of ways that we as journalists are starting to look at how you use kind of social media as a tool because it's really uncharted territory. I mean, mm -hmm. th this is kind of the new frontier. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that you raised the Iran deal. I remember from inside the administration, we would have these um, really sort of like hand wringing sessions when we were talking about our rollout plan. You have like this 20 page plan of I will call Brad Clapper and then I will call Rosie Gray and then someone will retweet this and it's all going to be perfect. Uh, and then someone would sort of raise their hand and say, but remember that Foreign Minister Javad Zarif is just going to like tweet that we have a deal and like the whole rollout plan won't matter because he's just going to take to Twitter and announce it. Uh, and so more and more, even internally, you know, using other governments and, and sort of how they use social media impacts the way we think about communicating with audiences, both both domestic and foreign. Um, on a related note, sort of, and, and you've all touched on this a little bit, with the proliferation of social media and the, instantane, the instantaneous nature of getting the information out, do you feel that there's been a shift at all in sort of the priority of 
you have so much pressure to be the person breaking news uh, as opposed to sort of digging deeper and waiting until there's a story with context and more detail. I mean, how has the use of social media shifted sort of timelines um, and, and the emphasis on sort of long form quality reporting versus we were the first ones to actually announce that X happened? You know, I, I, I think that there was, there was a shift happening towards an emphasis on being the first for a while. And I actually think we're seeing a shift uh, sort of backwards towards mm -hmm. really making sure that you have something right before mm -hmm. you go out with it. Um, and part of that is because of this environment of like extreme misinformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, a lot of people have been kind of like falling flat on their faces with trying to be the first to like tweet some hot thing about Trump and then and retracting. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so I actually think that um, a lot of newsrooms are uh, putting a lot more emphasis now on, you know, making sure even if you're not gonna be the first one, just mm -hmm. making sure that you have it right. Mm -hmm. And I think building on that, I mean, the thing is with a lot of newsrooms, um, if you're not going to be first, then you better have something better to offer when you come second, third, or last, um, whether that's a new little tidbit of information about the story that somebody else missed because they were rushing, or just kind of an unexpected angle. Um, and I think in some ways that's good because it's pushing reporters to think a little bit more creatively than just, you know, I need to file a story on X sanctions that are dropping tomorrow, have it go out in the morning paper, and that's it. Um, I think it helps people sort of drive the narrative and explain to readers what might be counterintuitive. Uh, I think it's also on the on the negative side, sort of given the rise to these um, constant needs for a hot take. You you need to have a voice. You need to have a way to weigh in on the situation. And so sometimes it sort of feels like people are grasping at ways to say, "Well, I have this thing that you know when the AP reported it three hours before me that they didn't have." Only sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, not everyone can have the uh, the banner that certain news channels have where it's like breaking news, but it's like the same breaking news for like 24 hours uh, in a row, but uh, but we won't name names. Um, so the next question is interesting. Uh, you know, uh, you will have seen obviously that I, I've tried to make these questions pretty broad. Um, sort of the, the elephant in the room, of course, is we have a new administration that has taken social media usage to a completely new level. Uh, and when we discussed this before getting ready, we sort of, uh, you know, assumed or hoped maybe that, that a lot of those questions from the audience would maybe touch on those topics. So we've, we've tried to keep this a broader discussion of foreign policy and, and digital media. Um, I mentioned that because my next question when I when I sort of wrote it and thought about it was, you know, it would seem a mistake to not really address uh, this, this age of disinformation, misinformation, um, you know, when you have someone out of a server in Czechoslovakia with seven followers tweeting that, you know, it was really Ukraine that down the MH17 plane and not the Russians and it catches you know catches fire and it shows up on Dutch TV and you're just thinking how did how did we spiral out of control like this um, and when I originally wrote the question I said in an age where foreign governments actively and aggressively disseminate false information mm -hmm. how do you shape your reporting I think I will make it more general and just say <laughs> when governments uh, engage in um, disseminating false information um, I guess, what is the role, what is the responsibility of a journalist um, in the case of a, an open platform like Medium, um, where the idea is not to edit and to let people have a free voice, you know, what is your responsibility um, if, if someone's putting up uh, what is known to be false information? Um, do you report it in a story but point out that it's false? Do you give it equal weight because this is the position of, of, of one side? How do you manage that um, in, in, in because this is a foreign policy panel in the case of, of foreign governments who have, who have been doing this. There you go. Go ahead. Um, so I think we take a step back from, from that question and, and ask uh, kind of what we consider to be the underlying question is how mm -hmm. is journalism and news media funded, right? To us, the, the, there's an inherent flaw and it's fundamentally broken how journalism and good reporting is is now being funded and now monetizes, right? Um, many times it's through entertainment, right? Like the BuzzFeed news doesn't make money, but BuzzFeed entertainment makes a lot of money and funds good journalism that BuzzFeed news is doing. Um, when Wall Street and Silicon Valley decided they were gonna monetize content on the internet through clicks and page views, they did an incredible, horrible disservice to news media in general and I think the world at large because it no longer became profitable for news organizations to spend the depth of time reporting and many still do that i'm not we're not making the case that that they don't but it's not as lucrative and not as profitable right um so and then that's also kind of had a trickle down effect to where you know uh, you have just 
fake news sites that have that have popped up that have learned to game the algorithms that have learned to drive clicks and drive traffic which again drives revenue through advertisements and um, you know makes them make them boatloads of money but fundamentally doesn't serve the public at large so we think there there needs to be a, a new model by which you know writers and news organizations and media companies can can monetize um, that's that's how we approach it that's how we think about things I think as we have more of an editorial vote voice as a platform as we start to think about um, I mean it's frankly not a challenge that we've had to really address yet but as it becomes more of a challenge it's something that we I think would be rather heavy-handed in trying to um, elevate smart thoughtful perspectives and real news and not the fake stuff so I think, I mean, look, um, governments are by nature interested parties, so mm -hmm. they are inherently biased, skewed, um, unreliable. I won't take that personal. Even Obama <laughs> predicted that. Um, there, there's no status quo we can really look back to when government information was gold and could be taken at face value. Um, now, I think what's different now is you have a couple things. One is kind of how modern, how, how social media and also kind of modern communications allow Russia, for example, to use RT to reach uh, um, people in Kansas. I mean, it's just kind of, it, before it used to be you had to smuggle out kind of, um, you know, state funded propaganda on a pamphlet and then go to a mm -hmm. workers party meeting in the, in the Cold War and try to, I don't know, inspire kind of pro-Soviet, anti-American sentiment. It's much different now. You you can kind of do it with pointed, uh, aggressive, but not usually very fair news. And that and that's not to say that's the only version. It's it's all it's, it's ubiquitous, um, uh, and it's it's the ubiquity plus the speed with which the things and memes and kind of this these kind of ideas catch fire. And that's where kind of Twitter and other social media platforms have kind of created this kind of accelerating force whereby something gets fed once, which gets retweeted twice, which gets shared three times, which, and it, and it kind of builds its own momentum in a way that, again, the kind of workers party pamphlet by, you know, producing some oblast uh, didn't do. Uh, you know, in the 1950s. And I, I would argue that we're seeing, um, yes, every government is an interested party and every government misleads its citizens to an extent and reporters, um, but there's been a drastic difference in the willingness of the current administration to sort of mislead journalists. I can speak firsthand. I think under the Obama administration, if we want to take the Iran deal. Um, I'm sure a lot of people in this room read the New York Magazine profile on Ben Rhodes, where the thesis was essentially that Ben Rhodes created an echo chamber to mislead reporters and the citizens about the merits of the Iran deal. Uh, whether or not you buy that thesis, the overall charge isn't that there is an outright lie, it's that reporters were misled. Uh, and I can speak from experience that I've talked to people in the White House who will tell me off the record that something is patently false, but won't say it on the record. Um, and it's because they're they're deliberately, intentionally lying to you. And I think that's uh, maybe not a new, but a, a additional challenge that reporters are kind of learning to grapple with in this new administration. Yeah, I mean, look at Kellyanne Conway going on TV and talking about alternative facts. I mean, we're dealing. We, we are dealing with kind of like an unpre like I don't want to say unprecedented necessarily. It's like a big right, claim, right. but I mean, we're dealing with like a different environment here in terms of uh, this administration's relationship with the truth and uh, and the fact that like everybody you talk to has some agenda that you have to. I mean, that's always the case, but I think it's especially so in this particular White House that is so obsessed with you know palace intrigue and like various camps taking shots at each other in the press, and so. There's some additional challenges, for sure. But, but I mean, as a journalist, it doesn't change that much for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we're doing is getting information. We're bouncing it off as, as wide a net as possible and seeing if things stick, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, you know, if you, if you previously got an off-the-record steer that said this is not true, and you, sometimes I still thought it was true, so I, I continued following it up. So y you may even... 
regardless of the scale on truth or prevarication of different people, the, the job of the journalist remains the same. And that's really talk to as many people as possible, lock down information as hard as you can, avoid the, the single sourcing at all costs because that's where we've seen around town people get in trouble. Um, so I, I think in that sense, journalism has kind of, traditional journalism has its value. Uh, so with that introduction to sort of get the conversation going, uh, I'd like to turn it over to audience questions. Um, if you have a question, feel free to direct it to, to any of the panelists individually or just throw out a general question and, and we'll let people weigh in um, as they have something to say. Questions? Yes, up here. Um, I'm retired from the federal government, but I used to be a press person. Um, are, but there are agencies. Oh, sorry, microphone. Sorry. Um, something uh, we've also seen that's new in this current administration is the alternate sites that have risen up because uh, certain agencies were no longer allowed to put certain information on Twitter and social media. Um, so, but I guess my question before that is, are there ground truth sources like Bureau of Labor Statistics or um, information coming out of EPA or NIH or other government agencies or organizations um, that you can take? Do you have to check those sources anymore? Did you before? Do you now? Um, I mean, what's the difference in terms of those sources that we used to believe? I mean, because it was pure research, um, census information. I mean, there is some basic information coming out of government that we've always believed, right? And we can't say it's all false anymore, or it has never been <laughs> um, I haven't seen any evidence that the Trump administration is messing with those sorts of statistics. So, um, so I, I mean, I think I, I guess my position on it right now is that I'm, I'm sort of treating them with the same level of skept those sorts of like Bureau of Labor statistics, et cetera, with the same level of skepticism or not that I always have. But I'd be interested to hear whether the other journalists agree. I would agree. I think that what, where you're getting misinformation from the government is more subtle. It's not going to be, at least for now, like Rosie was saying, we haven't seen um, messing with federal databases. Um, I think on our beats, there aren't really a ton of databases, unless you're referring to like federal contracting yeah. databases on like who paid how many billions of dollars for tanks here. Um, I think what we're more seeing is just sort of misconstruing facts or giving strange context to facts. You see that a lot around the refugee and the immigration debate. Uh, how many refugees are coming in from which countries? How many are likely to be terrorists? Um, and that's where it becomes the journalist's job to sift through and sort of explain to the reader, like, this is the number that the government is referring to. This is what it actually means. This is why this might be misleading. Right. Uh, this gentleman right here. So I want to bring your attention to the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which was supposed to open the floodgates to journalism and journalism integrity. And in fact, it did just the opposite. It enabled just six corporations to control essentially 90% of all media outlets. So you get this profound dumbing down, this, this entertainment, pseudo-entertainment, and news, and a lack of real drilling down and real core issues, such as you know the corruption in the government, uh, you know, Obama, for example, persecuted more whistleblowers than all other presidents combined. This is kind of left by the wayside. And really accomplished journalists like Chris Hedges, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hersh, are relegated to the sidelines. You don't see their work anymore. They're, they're relegated to writing for the, you know, London Review of Books, where we get this superficial garbage. No, I mean, it's no wonder that the media is so profoundly distrusted and that a lot of the fake media comes through false narratives generated by these corporate owned entities, such as the ones that three of you represent. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> Who wants to start with that one? <laughs> I work for a, um, a cooperative that I, I don't know who my corporate master would be. Um, <laughs> But regardless, um, I have never, ever experienced in my career any sense at all of 
of corporate interference or direction or even feedback, frankly. I mean, it, we have strict firewalls, uh, basically, mm -hmm. it's throughout the industry. But um, regardless, um, let me let me let me try to address uh, your questions about the the dumbing down of media because I think um, there is a social media component to that, and I think that reflects on kind of today's today's theme. And I think that is a danger uh, somewhat with kind of reducing things to 140 characters, um, making things snarky and catchy so they get retweeted a lot. Uh, you know, writing about NATO in listicle form or however, you know, th this, these are kind of catchy things that, that make money and um, they don't necessarily provide the best service for an informed public. And I think, I think that's fair, but um, I think a lot of uh, media organizations are still trying to figure out one, relevance, two, income and three kind of how to adjust to these new technologies to do good reporting and, I, and we're all doing we're all i think we're doing some really good reporting a lot of it doesn't get seen maybe as much as some of the other stuff um but it's a challenge it's 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 a new ball game and we're not all there yet and i would, I would push back that i think while you do see the dumbing down of reporting you also see an exponential rise of incredible long-form reporting that, like Brad said, might not get as much attention, to which I would say the onus is on the readers to make that type mm -hmm. of journalism profitable. Uh, last year, the New York Times Magazine devoted an entire magazine to a long-form piece about how the Middle East had crumbled. I, I don't think you ever would have seen something like that, at least I can't remember in my lifetime seeing a piece of journalism like that. Um, in 2015, the Huffington Post, which is probably what you would consider an example of the dumbing down of media, started a long-form platform called Highline, where we've had just incredibly long form, well reported feature pieces. So I think just as media has become larger, more expansive and more democratized, yeah, there's a lot of crap that's probably not worth your time, but there's also a lot of really good stuff out there. And I, I, I you know, just from my time at the NSC, I can recall uh, a couple of stories, at least long form stories that, that Seymour Hirsch, uh, you know, was the author of that, um, you, you know, you could get into debates about, you know, sort of the discussion of false information and disinformation, you know, there were a lot of factual issues with some of those articles. Um, so there is a way for people, and I think, you know, Medium is another example, right? I mean, if 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 there are people that are out there that feel like they, they don't have a voice, I mean, there are platforms now that allow more people than ever to engage, but I think Jess is right. I would argue that, you know, part of that onus um, is on the reader as well to sort of sift through what you perceive to be the noise um, to really dig into whatever it is that, that you think would provide value um, in reporting. <coughs> Um, to sort of prioritize some of the questions, do, does anyone have a question that has a foreign policy nexus to it? Okay, I saw this hand go up before. Hi, I'm Sharon Bovat, Voice of a Moderate. I was just in Cuba and it was interesting because the Cuban people are very fearful. I was there last week about Donald Trump and they complained that they only had access to CNN. They want more news sources. And I said, Americans complain about all of our news sources. And it was interesting because I was taken and they said they wanted me of a corruption and fraud blogger because there's a pier made for a verse for a thousand yachts. They said the mainstream media in America, nobody will cover this because it involves government corruption, both our governments. It's in Veradero, Cuba, it exists. The people are scared to death because the government's cut back on their education and healthcare to pay for it and they believe that a revolution is on the way because of the new wet foot, dry foot. Do you think the mainstream media will cover this story if I show them a picture of a thousand bursts ready to go for yachts that is empty? Thank you. Do we have, do we have any Latin America watchers on the panel? I, I've so. done some reporting in Cuba, so I'll, I'll, I'll bite the bullet on this one. Show me what you have. I can't. I don't know if we'll do it. Right. All right, great. <laughs> See, you, See, the you use proved, of, you of, of the point. digital media to, to So I'm already to behind in an answer. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I think your your comment that uh, Cubans want more than CNN as a news source is just wonderful. Um, coming from a country that had such firm state control over its media for so long, to want a multiplicity of views is, is fantastic, um, and surely they. Yeah, they, they deserve that. And 
you know. Um, but I'll I'll take a look at your information, and we have a correspondent in Havana uh, who I've worked with on stuff. So I'm happy to take a look. And Cubans, I mean, following up on the social, the sort of digital media thread, I mean, one of the most interesting ways, I worked on Cuba for several years, uh, including on the wet foot, dry foot uh, changes. And one of the most amazing ways I've seen people disseminate information in a state controlled system is they, they have something called El Paquete, which is essentially a digital thumb drive and someone copies all of this illicit material or whatever it is, and it sort of spreads like wildfire. Um, so people, even if they don't have access to the internet or traditional tools, Wi-Fi is very difficult down there to get. Um, this information somehow using digital tools, there's a way to disseminate it. Um, and it certainly doesn't answer the mail in terms of giving people access to more information. Um, but it is incredible. I found in, in many of the countries where I've worked, and you guys probably see the same thing, how creative people are, right? It's it's really hard in a digital age to hold people back from, from information um, when there's even the slightest bit of connectivity, and Cuba's a great example of that. Um, another question. Uh, how about all the way in the back? Uh, hi. Um, well, my question was, um, uh, if we start with the beginning of uh, journalism, uh, we, we uh, noticed that being a journalist, usually I'm not one, but I uh, suppose, usually taking, not, um, is not taking sides of any, so, any stories. But we, I noticed, even I just have to read a newspaper, I can already tell which side the journalism is, either it's liberal or conservative. Um, my question is, is it, for example, when someone, for example, start working for CNN or any other um, companies, do you need, you need to choose a side when you start working? Do you need to be already say, okay, I follow the vision of CNN, or am I conservative and I keep and I keep that vision that I have when I start, for example, my career, or do I follow the the, the path of, for example, CNN, which is I want to say liberal um, newspaper, and like how how hard is it to be neutral to have like a, his own vision? Um, well, there's definitely not some sort of grand media conspiracy, like sort of like an ideological, uh, you know, an attempt to like make reporters conform to a certain ideological bent. I mean, there is such a thing as right wing media and left wing media. And then there's the mainstream media. And I leave to others the debate over whether the mainstream media has its own uh, ideological um, leanings. But I certainly don't think that at any news organization that I've heard of that there's any sort of moment of feeling like you have to choose sides in a partisan way. I mean, I think that most reporters are out there just trying to do the best job that they can and that our real commitment is just sort of to fairness and, you know, as much objectivity as we can manage. To, to add on that, um, one, one thing that my editor has said a lot of times, um, I work at a news outlet that would define itself as progressive, which a lot of people would just say is left-leaning. Um, he would say that every single person in this room has a bias, and no matter how much you try to hone that bias in and be objective, your bias is going to inform your reporting, even if that's just the way in which you arrange quotes from both sides. You know, do you do you give the person that you believe to be right the last word? Do you choose the better quote from that person? His argument, which agree to disagree his argument would be that it's better for the reporter to let you know what his or her bias is up front so the reader can take that into account and let that inform the credibility of the piece Sorry, I, I would maybe just pipe in on the social media side and uh, social media I'll say social media but um, you, you've got two main players in Facebook and Twitter right where Twitter is kind of this self-selected bubble for a lot of people and what they choose to follow and who they're getting their information from. And Facebook, which is very much a pay-to-play model and, and based on which advertisers or which news organizations are willing to pay to promote their content is whether or not you're going to, to see it and whether or not you've indicated through their algorithm that's the type of stuff that you enjoy reading. So another self-select model. Our perspective, and I'll, I'll just be brief, like our perspective is that we want to build an audience and a readership that wants and actively seeks to have their biases challenged. 
Um, and so surfacing content and surfacing posts or stories and perspectives from people that either self-identify as conservative or progressive side by side around an issue um, aligned with with posts and perspectives that, that are, are trying to remain neutral or, or agnostic in, in terms of the, the political or, or partisan implications or ideological implications is something that we think is, is pretty needed and pretty necessary. And I think that the three, I, I mean, I think the, the three you know news organizations that are represented on, on on here do that well as well in terms of giving a balanced perspective across the, a whole a whole range of issues. Great question. Uh, this woman right here, the scarf. Hi, um, I'm wondering how does uh, or does the context of the country you're reporting in um, for those who've reported abroad or who cover foreign policy. Um, Ethically speaking, how do you manage sensitive situations? Like if there's a story that, and, and you know, for purposes of this discussion, maybe how the internet has affected that as well, but um, if there's a story that, you know, you know will upset uh, relations with X country for the US, um, how do you walk around that, if at all? And maybe where is the discussion made? Is it a management decision? Is it the reporter that sort of makes the call? The editor? I think, I think we both have good examples, but they're, they're, they're the same country, but different. So I'll start. Um, I learned very early on uh, that the US and Iran were holding secret nuclear negotiations in 2013. Um, it was the most sensitive thing probably happening in the United States national security. It took me eight months to write the story because I didn't have all the details right. And I went to source after source and was told I'm not, you know, they either wouldn't tell me, some of it was right, some of it was wrong, a certain thing was wrong twice. So I started realizing some of it was wrong, but not all of it was wrong. And I plugged away. Uh, but it never came into my mind that this is an important negotiation so the public doesn't have a right to know. What came into my mind was this is an incredibly sensitive negotiation so the public only has the right to know the absolute truth on it. So that, that guided my thinking. It wasn't that I should hoard this information vision about what the public has the right to read or not, that's not my job. My job is to report and to find out the truth. Now there are kind of very um, specific situations like we've done, we've all been in situations with stories with hostages, um, people who've been kidnapped, um, people who've been kidnapped who may have certain religions, Stephen Sotloff, for example, was a good one. Um, so you, there is there are cases when people's lives are at stake where you withhold information, but if it's diplomatic discomfort or it puts it strains a negotiation. I mean, I mean, what the public thinks is. I mean, frankly, when they were negotiating secretly on Iran, they were probably more worried about what. Bibi Netanyahu was going to do when he found out more than what um, the voters in Ohio were going to do. So um, there are very specific cases when lives are at risk, um, but not because it puts governments in an uncomfortable situation. I think it's it's an interesting question and going to Brad's point about hostages and, and sensitive military operations is is another one um, is sort of the role of government right and and especially in the digital age um, we would for example when we were evacuating uh, the American embassy in Libya uh, it was an overland movement uh, that was going to take about 12 hours and in all of the planning sort of going back to the earlier conversation a lot of the planning was the contingency of you know not that a reporter in the US who's asleep is going to find out but that send Libya is going to start tweeting that he sees, you know, 25 U.S. diplomatic plated cars um, convoying, you know, across. Um, and then the question for us always becomes, at what point, you know, does the government sort of step in and make a request and say, look, Brad, you have the story, um, but here are the reasons why we think there's a national security imperative to, to hold off on publishing it. Um, and sometimes you make a compelling argument, usually when there's service members or others whose lives are at risk. Um, and sometimes you don't, because it is really, a, you're really going to throw a wrench into these diplomatic 
diplomatic negotiations. Um, and then, you know, the, the publication really needs to make a decision about whether that's a compelling reason not to run a story uh, because it makes our lives a little bit more difficult. Uh, and you, you balance that with with sort of the, the right to know. I'll give you a counter example. And maybe Bernadette was involved with this. I hope we don't have. <laughs> Uh, right before the State of the Union address in 2016, um, an American boat in the Persian Gulf went kind of off kilter. Uh, I was serve I was I was that day or that week. I was serving in my current job as national security editor, and our correspondent at the Pentagon discovered that a bunch of Americans had been taken prisoner by uh, Iran. Now we were. Uh, heavily uh, pressured by the former administration not to say anything or publish anything. And the argument that was given was that they would be executed. We, uh, as a news source, determined that to be not a credible argument. One, because there was no real history in the last decades of Iran executing Americans uh, for straying into international waters. Two, um, because uh, they were on the cusp of signing this huge nuclear agreement, uh, sorry, not signing it, but um, implementing. implementing it, and they were gonna get a lot and a lot of money. So there was very little interest for Iran to kind of do that and set back their entire economy and years of diplomatic efforts. Three, uh, it was kind of alternatively put to us that maybe we could publish it, but wait until after the State of the Union. So we started getting the idea, ah, okay, you don't want this published because it interferes with the president's State of the Union address, which is different than lives are in danger. So that's the kind of thing we would weigh in a in a situation like that. In that case, we printed. We went to we went to and in the end, the situation was resolved as it was going to be. It just probably made it a little harder uh, under the glare of the public and certain presidential candidates at the time. But but there there was a story that um, it was me. And the Washington Post and um, Reuters all were sort of working on this story about the Iranian prisoner exchange. Um, I don't know how long the other outlets had it. We had it probably four months before it happened in last January. Um, and when we went to State Department, I mean, we, we had it. They said, yes, you're right. There's, there's negotiations. They're very close to happening. Um, and they did make a credible case that these things change all the time. And if you do publish it before the very last detail is finalized, um, these guys could get stuck in Iran forever, and that will be your fault, including a Washington Post reporter, Jason Rezaian. Um And that, that was a really hard decision for us. In retrospect, it seems kind of easy that we made the right decision in holding. Um, but at the time, you know, you're, you're wondering if some of the concerns Brad brought, brought up are, are true. They just they don't want the Republicans to say that they're negotiating with, you know, the bad guys, and they're trying to cover their own backs. Um, we went all the way up the chain to our editors. We talked to our lawyers. Um, and ultimately ended up holding the story until the prisoners were in the air out of Iran. Uh, next question. How about over here at the end? <clears throat> the gentleman on the end. Hello. Um, I am curious about the journalistic debate uh, surrounding the publication of the Trump dossier, um, which is kind of the opposite of what we just went through, which was a very, uh, you know, heavily sourced and a lot of work done into it. Um, and just the debate between the way that CNN handled that story versus the way that BuzzFeed handled it with uh, the publication of that document um, without any context. And I think there might be an open source component to that too, Matt, so maybe you could weigh in as well. Very briefly, I'd say CNN did it right. They couldn't confirm what the document was, so they didn't run it. We hear gossip all the time. We don't write that said gossip exists unless we can prove that it's true. Uh, CNN found a legitimate news peg, which was this information exists, and top intelligence officials thought it was important enough that the president-elect should know about it. Um, I think that was excellent reporting. Um, I think BuzzFeed does incredible journalism. I really respect their work. Um, I think they made the wrong call there, and I think they made journalists look less credible. I mean, this is a little bit sensitive for me because I used to work for BuzzFeed, um, although I was not there by the time that uh, that this incident with the dossier happened. I will say that uh, Ben Smith, who is a friend and mentor to me, is a very thoughtful guy, and this was not made 
uh, I'm sure in any sort of like slapdash way. I mean, he has uh, a theory of the case, which is that, you know, if elites are talking about something and if it's reached the point where, uh, you know, the highest levels of the U.S. government are looking at something, then people have a right to know what it is. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether they made the right call, but I can I can tell you that I really don't think that um, it was done for any sort of like cheap clicks or anything like that. Uh, questions, foreign policy nexus questions. Okay, how about right here in the front? I work in the IT industry and I 20 years ago wrote a piece for the Aspen Institute on sovereignty in the network world about how the internet was gonna change our sources of information. I got a lot of things right, including something like WikiLeaks. Mm. But what I got wrong was that I didn't anticipate that with this flood of information, people would read some of the stories that came out with WikiLeaks. In a few cases, they would get mad at the corruption that was exposed. But in other cases, they would just say, oh, we knew it all along, let's not bother. You know, why, why hasn't the increased transparency caused by WikiLeaks actually led to people getting really upset about their corrupt leaders. I mean, we see all these stories didn't get printed overseas that came out of WikiLeaks. Instead, we had stories about Hillary's emails, but far worse things have been exposed in countries all over Europe, nothing. I mean, I, I guess the question there is, is, is your question why the, that the Western media wasn't writing about it or local media in those countries yeah. or Western media? In those countries. In yeah. those local countries. European countries. Local, local media. I mean, I don't know if you guys have. have I can't. I can't really speak to that because yeah. I. What I can say is that obviously the WikiLeaks disclosures were like heavily covered. So. Or U.S. politicians. My point is. Sure. I. But I'm just saying I can't really weigh in on like the media environment in France or Germany or wherever else. I, I think uh, you know sometimes doing these kind of investigative dives, whether, okay, with WikiLeaks, they're putting information out there, but somebody has to connect the dots and make it read and make sense. And especially in smaller countries, especially in the developing countries, uh, it takes resources and know-how, and I don't know if uh, that's, you can find that everywhere. I thought it was interesting, though, how with the Panama Papers, um, the pooling of resources allowed for a kind of uh, use of talents from far and wide to produce stories that were global, but very, very local and specific. Mm -hmm. And they did have kind of big splashes. You know, you could read stories from Tucson to, I don't know, Slovenia, and it would be about local leaders or local industrialists who had money and the murkiness or not of, of those funds and and that that maybe that's a kind of way for the future kind of you know instead of this kind of uh, atomized media landscape worldwide you can kind of come together in momentary alliances and produce kind of big stories that mean a lot to a lot of different people and I think in the case of the Panama Papers you saw real-world consequences I mean uh, Iceland lost you know uh, had, had a resignation there were several countries you know smaller sort of to fit the, the scale of what you were talking about where there were actual outcries from the local population um, when, when this was raised up um, other questions okay how about we go back over here uh, with the glasses right up here There. I'm wondering if you think potential outcomes of net neutrality laws will affect future foreign policy and the access we have to it and that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the, natural, the natural place to look. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's something, well, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm best positioned to, to, to talk on it, frankly. Like, that's a natural fit for the industry that I, that I come from, but it's not something that we've necessarily started weighing in on as a company. <laughs> and I'd hate to preempt anything that we wanted to do in, in this environment. <laughs> it's it's making policy in the digital age. You could tweet it and, and it will just be. Right? It's the new wave. Yeah. I don't know if, if you guys have perspectives on that, but. Uh, this, like, this is above my pay grade. 
So. <laughs> Great. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I, 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 I'm not an expert on net neutrality, but I have to say one thing that, that kind of strikes me when I think about journalism and social media, and maybe it's not really connected, but is how much of our reporting and our news production now is happening via third party, via corporations. You know, you're doing things via Twitter, or via Facebook, and um, you know, we think of that as kind of direct engagement, but essentially it's not. We're going through a corporation who is controlling the means of our production in some ways or the means of our dissemination. And it seems great because everything's faster and it's easier, but I wonder if there's a, a danger in that long term. Um, foreign policy, given how countries are trying to control increasingly the internet, even in kind of what we would call soft authoritarian countries where it's not, you must say this, but kind of, I don't know, creating the frame of reference in which you must operate. And these corporations are not independent. You know, they want to work in these countries too. And I wonder how much that's going to affect how we distribute news, uh, how we operate. It also gets into the debate, and this is perhaps for a different panel, uh, because it gets more into sort of a corporate policy debate, but you know, when you have companies like Facebook or Google uh, who are looking to move into markets like China, where you know the government obviously puts constrictions and forces changes in the product, and you have to begin to weigh uh, as a company, you know, are you looking at profits? Uh, can you make the justification that even getting a foot in the door gives access to people that they wouldn't have had, and so it's still an okay thing? You're still doing, you know, doing no harm, um, or are you selling out uh, what your principles were and sort of allowing someone to censor you? Um, so again, I think a debate not for this particular panel, but but it raises an excellent question that I think at the corporate level, um, media companies have to grapple with in the international space. Um, so I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, why don't we go in the back right here? Hi, uh, Andrew Overton from the British Embassy. Thanks for uh, hosting this. I've got a question that hopefully combines a bit of the digital, uh, digital diplomacy. First question is for you, Bernadette, if you, don't, if, you can, uh, if you don't mind. So when we're old, that was a kind of a big effort from the White House some new digital tools to kind of explain that and bring the public on board. So you had the Iran deal uh, Twitter page. I think it was a Medium page as well. Could you say a bit about how effective you found that um, and whether it was a useful tool? Questions to the journalists. How did you guys perceive those tools? Were they simply propaganda arms or did you use them uh, as is, um, or to dig into further you know, detail? Um, so it's a great question. I think one of the things we found from the time we worked on the interim deal through the actual implementation <laughs> of the final deal, which which spanned you know a couple of years, uh, was that in a typical foreign policy communications challenge where you're essentially communicating and, and talking and targeting audiences that are sort of in the beltway, like elites. Um, this became such a hot button issue uh, for so many members of Congress. Uh, and so there was really an emphasis on how do we gin up support uh, and get the message out in sort of regional areas, in areas where the White House wouldn't necessarily think, oh, you're talking about an Iran nuclear deal, we're gonna sort of reach out to, you know, Joe and John Smith in Iowa, um, but it really became that sort of an effort and a, a digital campaign um, was really one of the most effective ways to sort of disseminate that message. Um, I think the other reason that, that we focused on a digital campaign, and this gets a little bit to what Jessica was saying earlier about um, the New York Times profile and this concept of sort of an echo chamber is, you know, the information should be factual and it should be truthful, but how do you sort of um, work to get basically a grassroots organization to help disseminate it, right? And if you provide people digital tools, it becomes easier to say, okay, we're gonna have 50 people retweeting it, or maybe this will go viral, or someone will create a meme about it, or someone will share it on a Facebook page. Um, and it was the first time, I think, in the administration on the foreign policy side that we felt um, that a policy was 
walking the line between passing or failing based on public opinion, which is a little unusual. So it was a whole different way of, of thinking about how we market that and explain it to the public. Um, so I'd be interested to hear, you know, how, how journalists sort of reacted and responded to that because um, it was, it was I mean, an interesting time. I mean, sure. any like medium post by the White House, I'm going <laughs> to treat with like a large dose of skepticism mm -hmm. and, you know, like, I, but then again, it's like you can always, I mean, government, you're always reading between the lines in terms of what they're putting out there and why did they put that out there and what does it actually mean and what are they actually trying to say. And so it's useful in that sense, but you would never like use that as just unless it's, you know, like or something that's like literally just pure information. So, so yeah, I mean, and I think you guys probably feel pretty much the same way. I think it was helpful for the purpose of having the White House's position out there in a very clear way. Um, not that we're going to go ahead and then, you know, put out the White House's position as indisputable yeah. fact. Um, but it was very clear, like, this is what the White House is arguing the Iran deal will do. This is what they're saying is how many centrifuges will be dismantled. This is the timeline they're laying out. Um, and that makes it pretty go to critics of the deal and be like, hey, like, what do you think is the weakness in this bullet point? Like, where do you think that they're not telling the whole story here? Um, so I think that was beneficial. Um, there's a little bit of heightened sense sensitivity from journalists because of this really aggressive push. I know that the White House would send out these daily roundups of Iran deal coverage, and it would be news stories that they benefited their argument, news, or news that said the Iran deal is a good thing. Um, and I know that it was almost sort of like a source of shame for reporters to be on there, because even if your article was good and you feel like it was fair and it was well reported, you just sort of felt like a propaganda tool yeah. being listed out there like that. Uh, the other thing on, in terms of the, the public opinion issue is um, it, that was really interesting to see the White House try so hard to make the, the public opinion argument for the Iran deal that this is going to make the world safer. Um, ultimately, it came down to a vote pretty much down party lines in Congress that wouldn't have passed if it were a simple majority. So it is sort of a, an important caveat to remember how effective uh, that type of campaign is in this hyper-polarized world. I think it was also, you know, just as a footnote, it was an interesting example, and you alluded to it in sort of the, the daily roundup of, of stories, was the use of digital mediums, not only to highlight reporters who were reporting on it that, you know, we thought represented our position, um, but, you know, ordinary citizens, so to speak. So people from the non-pro community or people from the anti-war community, um, you know, politics makes strange bedfellows and foreign pro policy even more so, uh, where, you know, you'd have Code Pink putting something out saying like, this this deal is like the best thing, we can't go to war. And, you know, in the administration, you're thinking, wow, how often is Code <laughs> Pink like siding with us and our position on something? Um, so I think it was, you saw not only the White House using it to put out proactively our position, um, but also sort of sweeping in through the digital sphere to see how we could repurpose content from others to say, here are credible voices that aren't government uh, voices, you know, advocating for the same sort of position that we have, which was a new a new tactic for us, I think, in the foreign policy space, at least. I well, thought, I thought it, was, it, was, it was propaganda, though. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> for, uh, well, I mean, I, it, I say that in a yeah, neutral sense. That yeah. doesn't mean it's all lies. Right. It's, well, I mean, it's, it's just the I question mean, is, propaganda is, comes, is anything, right? Is, is the daily press briefing propaganda is, you know, is, is anything that the government's putting out, right? What is, what is the definition of propaganda? But I, I think it, it, it was very interesting because, I mean, I think critics uh, of the White House effort kind of viewed it in a vacuum as if there wasn't a, uh, incredibly aggressive counter effort at the same time, which was employing lots of uh, methods of its own to try to discredit the deal. So in that sense, view it as part of a war in camp, uh, take what you, you know, take the arguments of both sides and, and, and kind of sift through it. Um, you know, if I think good journalists kind of didn't lean on either. Uh, they have, but there was, you know, on, on the fringes of both sides, you had kind of people who took both sides at face value. And that was kind of a, a disservice. I mean, people zeroed in on the kind of bad examples on each side, but I think by and large, most of the serious journalistic uh, news organizations 
did a pretty good job, I think. I, I thought it was, though, like a good display of transparency in the sense that th it wasn't just the propaganda of the, you know, the president's op-ed of here's why I think this is a good deal and, you know, commentary from Ernest Moniz and Jack Lew of like aspects that they worked on and why they thought aspects of that deal were important, but it was the full text of the bill out mm -hmm. in the open. So they created a medium publication and published the full text of the bill. And there were a couple of results of that. I thought that, that, that just the, the transparency behind publishing a full text of this international agreement for anyone in the world to go read, hear people's commentary on, hear how people were reacting to it, not just the, the propaganda from, from policymakers on both sides, but, but people that had other expertise and other interests in, 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 the, uh, in the deal itself. There were, there were two results that, that I thought were I thought were particularly powerful about why we thought that was an interesting way for the White House to use Medium and why we feel like these new digital tools add value to foreign policy community and, and governments and, and politics and broadly is Senator from uh, from Texas, he actually created his own medium publication and he published up until 24 days until they took a vote in the Senate. He published a post every single day of various aspects of the bill that he and his Republican colleagues opposed. And it was right there linked to the actual language in the bill, it's in the, not the bill, and the agreement itself. Um, and, and Senator Schumer, when he announced his opposition to the Iran deal, he did that with the Medium Post, and he was able to control the timing that, that, that he decided to release that information, and he was also able to spend 1,300 words talking about how he, I mean, he was in quite the predicament, right? There's many implications for the potential and, and what subsequently became the majority leader of the sitting president's Senate. Um, and as a, as a Jewish man opposing a, a, a deal and the implications in Israeli and Palestinian relations, and he was able to talk about the implications of that with 1,300 words of how he approached all those things. And I thought that was a level of insight and storytelling that you don't often hear or see through 140 character treats or press releases or even floor. So I think uh, the Iran deal always elicits lots of passion <laughs> and comments. This is no different. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, let's, if we could make it a brief one, uh, the, the woman in the back. I work on uh, U.S. engagement with the United Nations, and we have a couple of areas where we are under threat at the moment, including um, three bills in the, on the Hill to cut U.N. funding, a draft executive order that would cut U.N. funding, um, obviously, the refugees executive order does influence um, U.S. work at the U.N. Because we want to keep the door open to working with the administration, to working with Congress um, in positive and constructive ways to get the best outcomes we can get. At the same time, we have a lot of polling and information from the American public that says this is not the way most Americans feel. 88% of Americans want active engagement at the U.N. They do not want to be isolated from the rest of the world. Do you have any tips for how we can um, sort of walk this tightrope, um, pitch you stories in the right ways, knowing that we kind of need to gently correct the information out there um, while not alienating um, the, the current administration or members of Congress or inciting marches, but still um, applying to people's indignation, if you will? <laughs> Pitching tips? <clears throat> well, tips for pitching me would be like sending me good stories that are exclusives. <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, but in terms of like the, I mean, look, like I can't really tell you how to do your job. Um, as a journalist, like, you know, I don't care about your relationship with the administration. Like, I care about like my work that I so like in terms of pitching me in a way that like sort of walks this fine line between like what you're trying to do and what the administration's trying to do in your relationship with them. I mean that's outside the sphere of like what uh, would be sort of my interest in that interaction. Um, actually, I mean I think Bernadette might be sort of a good person to field this kind of question. I mean, you know, it's obviously like you're working on UN issues. Like this is time for you to be working on that um, due to, you know, this president's stance towards the United Nations. Um, but Bernadette might have some diplomacy tips. Yeah. So, I mean, just off the top of my head without knowing too much about sort of the, the depth of the issues, this is where I would say pulling sort of from the Iran example and also on Cuba, we did a lot of this, where you 
I think need to look at um, not only working with journalists and the media, but stakeholder outreach. Um, and it's this concept of sometimes you as a government really can't be the voice because if you are, it almost hurts your cause because you're either viewed as propaganda or people are like, oh, the government again. Um, so how do you find credible voices who share the opinion, opinion that you have, but who also have credibility up on the Hill, in the media, uh, who have contacts? You know, are there folks in the international arena uh, who may who may get involved? I mean, on the Ar Iran deal, and Andrew will remember this, you know, it was not just a bilateral agreement. So you had ambassadors from the UK, ambassadors from France, you know, foreign ministers from those countries writing joint op-eds that they were placing, you know, managing to to sort of get um, support into when they did press conferences or things like that. So really think about stakeholders um, who may also have another angle that's more appealing to the media um, because of what their perspective is or how they're affected. Um, so, so, you know, you don't necessarily, especially if you're worried about sort of how the administration views you trying to do something that's contrary to what they're trying to do, um, engaging others uh, in that in that struggle with you, I think is. is I a think Bernadette's point about the uh, foreign ambassadors. I'm sorry to keep bringing it back to the Iran deal, but it, it reminded me that there was this one day. Um, I can't remember the day or the senators, but there's four senators, mm -hmm. Democratic senators, who were sort of on the fence about the deal. They all came out on the same day and decided to support it. Um, and I, I asked all of them, like, did you guys, did you guys plan this? Like, why, what, did you guys all decide to come out? It wasn't like the deadline to decide was all that imminent. Um, they had all just had this closed door briefing with ambassadors from the P5 plus one, who basically said, like, we are not going to put sanctions back on if you guys back out of this. Like, this is what you have, and you kind of need to stick with it, or you're going to lose all credibility. And I thought that was fascinating because the diplomats hadn't really told them anything that the American government hadn't told them in the same briefings, but it had so much more credibility coming from outside partners. That's all we have time for, uh, so we'll wrap it up. But thank you all for being here and for the questions uh, and the interest, and thanks so much to the to the panel um, for the diversity of, of views. And uh, we'll, I guess, see you at the next the next iteration. I don't know if there's an announcement about one year. No announcement, <laughs> so <laughs> we will end it there. Thank you so much. Have a great night.